Imran Khan, thanks for joining Deutsche Welle. So I want to start by talking about the war in Ukraine. This is, of course, it's the biggest war in Europe in many decades since the Second World War. It's a war that is threatening to throw tens of millions of people around the world into hunger. It's a war that's driving inflation in Pakistan. I want to make sure that our viewers understand your position on the war. Are you prepared to condemn the Russian invasion? Well, Richard, let me say one thing. Uh, first, I want to clarify that I am basic an anti-war person. I do not believe that military uh, solutions uh, exist in this world because when you try and solve one problem with a military uh, operation, you actually end up creating a lot of other problems, as is the case with the Ukraine war, as was the case with Iraq war in Afghanistan for 20 years. They created so many other problems. So uh, here's someone who opposed all these wars. And so if I was consulted about the Ukraine war, I would certainly have uh, uh, advised not to go into that. But, but Having Mr. said that, Mr. Hunt, I have a certain... If I may just interject there, because you have said this in the past and made the point that you, you opposed the Iraq war and you opposed the Afghanistan war. But you were very explicit in opposing those wars. You even stood in, in Hyde Park in London in 2003 and made a speech against the Iraq war. You condemned it very vociferously. Why are you not doing the same thing with the war in Ukraine? Well, let me say one thing. Uh, you know, I was going to explain why. The reason is that Pakistan has... Uh, uh, our future is tied up with uh, Russia in terms of gas, oil, and specifically wheat, because we, ha we uh, have to import uh, wheat from uh, Russia because of our 220 million population. So when you start condemning people, you're taking sides. Basically, you know, uh, taking moral stands on international issues is very good, but when your country stands to suffer as a result of it, you have to have the luxury to be strong and rich enough to start making, uh, 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 taking sides. I be, my point of view in this is very simple. I, have, you know, I was then the prime minister. 220 million of people of Pakistan uh, elected me. Their main interest was that I look after the interest of the people and therefore uh, we wanted to have the luxury of remaining neutral in this, uh, in this war. Um, but you were very open in your criticism of the United States, and Pakistan has also depended on the United States, billions of dollars uh, of, of aid coming from the United States over the years. So are you suggesting that it's OK to criticise the United States publicly, even though you defend on them, uh, depend on them, but with Russia you have to uh, treat them with kind of kid gloves? Is that the relationship with Russia? Richard's slight difference. When I was condemning the, the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war, by the way, Afghanistan war directly affects Pakistan. We already have three, over three and a half million refugees, Afghan refugees in Pakistan. So what happens in Afghanistan, we get affected. Uh, but then I was, I was the prime minister of Pakistan. And so I was as a civilian, as a uh, as someone who, who, who b doesn't believe in wars, I, I could speak my mind. But when you become the prime minister, your responsibility then becomes the people of your country. And in our case, 100 million Pakistanis are vulnerable, you know, either below the poverty line or just above. So as a prime minister, that becomes my main responsibility. And so do you still defend, for instance, the fact that uh, you paid a visit to uh, Moscow on the eve of the invasion? You had a meeting with Vladimir Putin on the day, the very day the Russian invasion took place. Um, you defend that, do you? You think that that was OK to go ahead with that trip? Well, uh, Richard, uh, the facts were that when I arrived in, uh, in, in Russia, uh, in Moscow, uh, and the meeting was next morning. So when we woke up in the morning, that's when the invasion took place. So believe me, I wasn't consulted in that, and hardly did I know that this, was, this would happen. Ha had I known, I certainly would not have, uh, obviously not have gone, uh, taken that trip. But as it turned out, we were already there. 
and, and next morning was the invasion. But, but, but Mr Hunt, uh, uh, I'd like to point out that, for instance, on February the 22nd, the day before you arrived, um, there were already columns of Russian tanks in Donetsk. That was reported even by Reuters. I'm sure uh, your, um, your staff have access to Reuters. And on the very evening when you touched down, the very uh, eve of the invasion, when you touched down, you said to one of the people greeting you, what a time I have come. So much excitement. You clearly knew that we were on the brink of a war. <clears throat> Richard, now, look, let me make something very clear. The thing is that our Russian visit was planned long time ahead, a long time before. The reason why we wanted to improve our relationship with Russia was because during the Cold War, Pakistan was with the Western Bloc and India was with, uh, with neutral. And so we were always considered part of the Western Bloc and we never had good relationship with Russia. And so this was the first visit after many years by a Pakistan prime minister. And so the entire, uh, you know, uh, all the stakeholders in our country, we all thought about this, that how can we improve our relationship with Russia? That's how the visit, visit was planned. So when on the eve, even when we heard that there was a chance of something, we had a consultation. All of us sat together, um, our foreign office, and they came to the conclusion that if we cancel it this time, this, we will put our relationship with Russia in the cold storage. And bearing in mind the future where we need Russian wheat, re need Russian oil, and specifically the gas pipeline deal which has been on for six years, if we now cancel the visit, the country go is, was going to lose a lot. So uh, just like everyone else, Richard, let me just explain to you. What about Kashmir? Now, India has usurped uh, the rights of the uh, people uh, of I'm Kashmir. I'm sorry, Mr. Hunt. Kashmir I'm sorry. We, we, we is a disputed territory between the, Pakistan and India. The, the, so the, the, it's very important. No, no, Kashmir. but it's very important. No, no, Richard. I, I'm sorry, no, no, but Richard. we're asking no, you a Richard. question about Russia it's here, very Mr. Important. Hunt. And you, I don't want you to do a sort of what about uh, time I'm, to talking about Kashmir. I, I would just like no. to ask one further question about, about your visit to no, Russia before we move on. No, Richard. I want to ask you this question. I first want to move on and talk about Kashmir. No, I'm sorry, the, the Mr. Hunt. I'm the person who asks us. questions they in this interview. They matter to us. So uh, what yes. about us? Yeah, Why, but, how about uh, other people uh, not worrying about our human rights and what matters to us? Why is, are we supposed to condemn issues which are... It's a European issue. So please... Have some Mr. balance Hunt. in this. Uh, Mr. Hunt, don't it's, just, it is, it don't is. just put us in a spot that, you know, you, we, you have to, because it's your issue, we have to take sides. Allow us the luxury to stay neutral um, so that but, we can but, uh, look after our own people. As I, my as, responsibility, I repeat again, are my 220 million people of Pakistan. Of course, we understand that, Mr Han, and the, the, nobody would question that. I would like to ask one final question about the visit to Russia, because you did say that if you had known that you would have liked to reschedule that. Do you feel that Vladimir Putin, and of course, you know, being able to meet a, meet a world leader on the day of the invasion, this played to his advantage. D don't you feel somewhat used by that, uh, by that, those pictures that came to around, around the world uh, of you meeting him uh, in Moscow on the day of the invasion? Well, uh, if, you, if you recall, a lot of world leaders visited Moscow a few days before me and in the previous month, a lot of world re leaders visited. And remember the... the uh, the overseas uh, uh, trips are planned months ahead. They're not just at the spur of the moment. So uh, to answer your question, had I known that Russia was going to invade uh, uh, Ukraine the morning, uh, uh, you know, of a, a, a night we arrive and the next morning, I certainly would not have taken the trip. I mean, simple as that. But we weren't, we didn't know. The trip was planned months ahead. Mr. Khan, <clears throat> let, let's move on to another very important relationship for Pakistan, the relationship with China. Um, it's obviously invested a great deal of money, tens of billions of dollars over recent years uh, in Pakistan, partly as part of it, its Belt and Road uh, initiative. You, you've described China as a model for Pakistan's development. And yet, as we've, the world has kind of watched it, in recent years, it's increasingly becoming a totalitarian, uh, a, a surveillance state, a, a really very uh, stark 
authoritarian power. Does this give you any f grounds for discomfort? Look, uh, Richard, let me just say, s repeat myself again. Look, when the people of this country elected me as a prime minister, remember, when I was not the prime minister, I was free to say a lot of things. When you become the prime minister of the country, your number one priority becomes the people who elect you. Now, I have, they didn't elect me to talk about all the wrongs that are going on in this world. They elected me to look after their interests. And I repeat, 100 million Pakistanis are vulnerable, either below the poverty line or just above. So the top priority of any elected leader is first to look after the interest of his people. And so China, we have had a long relationship with them. China has invested in Pakistan. Our main interest is that we, the, the, the sort of development that China has done is much more likely to suit us than, for instance, the Western countries, which have developed long time ago. China developed in the last 30 years. It's a model that we, we could learn from. So I'm, when I praise China, I talk about the development model. Um, but are you not concerned with this degree of investment that's coming in from China about the, the amount of kind of control that, that, that China is going to start building up over Pakistan in the long run? All of these very important connections coming down from Xinjiang, for instance, and down towards, uh, down towards the ocean. Um, are you not concerned that there's, you're building up, you just describe a, de a dependency for, for things like wheat or, and gas on Russia, that there's a dependency building up here that, that could be risky? Uh, look, Richard, China so far, I mean, from the Pakistan experience, they have a very light touch. I mean, uh, when, I'm, when three and a half years of my government I mean, we never felt any pressure from Chinese to do this or that, or uh, there was, you know, I mean, we never felt, and by the way, all, throughout our relationship with China, it, China has never pushed its way around in this country to tell us to either do this or that or, uh, you know, force their own views on us. It's never happened in Pakistan. So. Uh, but but if, isn't that happening China indirectly, Mr. Han? Isn't that happening indirectly, Mr. Han, um, through the fact that you have evidently said in the past that you feel you do not evidently feel free to criticize uh, China about what is happening in Xinjiang, which, which neighbors Pakistan? Um, that you evidently have the, the, the same phenomenon as with Russia, in that you feel that you know Pakistan, by building these relationships with these great authoritarian powers, no longer has the ability to stand up uh, for, for instance, uh, an oppressed uh, Muslim minority in Xinjiang. Well, but, you know, Richard, look, I, this is where my problem was, I mean, where I got a little uh, worked up. Look, there are issues that bother us, Pakistan. Number one issue is Kashmir. It's a, a dispute. Kashmir is a dispute between Pakistan and India recognized by the world community uh, in 1948, by the UN Res Security Council resolutions. Now, 100,000 people have died in Kashmir in the last 30 years. The UN human rights reports on Kashmir are published about all the atrocities that are going on. How come no one even admo admonishes India, I'm talking about the Western countries, why don't they even uh, at least tell them that we will, if, if you don't, fix the human rights, we sanction you or something, they don't, they don't even take a stand against the violence going on in Kashmir right now, documented by the United Nations human rights reports. Now, how come nothing happens there and in Palestine? For us, for the Muslim world, because it's the third most sacred place for us, uh, Jerusalem, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, how come that there is Israel can get away with anything against the Palestinians, violate all human rights. Yet there's, you know, no condemnation, no strong words, no thought of sanctions. But, Yet but, when it concerns uh, the Khan, European uh, powers, uh, yeah. then we are supposed to take stands.
So, but, I mean, I, I just find it, this morality, which is selective, I find that a bit uh, hard to swallow. But, but I, I, think, I think what we're discussing here is that you're also accused of your own selective uh, 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 morality for criticising India over Kashmir. For instance, here at Deutsche Welle, we've done a lot of coverage of Kashmir. We've also done a lot of coverage uh, of the Western powers' unwillingness to criticise uh, India too openly for geopolitical reasons. We cover that a lot. But I'm asking you about, about Xinjiang. Um, I'm asking you to, to explain, do you have your own double standards when it comes to uh, uh, the matter uh, of Xinjiang and also when it comes to the war in Ukraine, uh, that you are simply uh, evidently not willing to criticise either openly? Richard, I'm not talking... You're a television station. You are free to criticise anyone. But your governments, how have they taken a stand on Kashmir, on what's going on there? The, in, in, two, in 2019, on 5th August, India violated international laws by taking away the statehood of Kashmir. That was guaranteed to them uh, in 1948. Now, was there any response? I spoke to the heads of states. I spoke to you know, Angela Merkel. I spoke, uh, spoke to Boris Johnson about this, what was going on in Kashmir. No response, because India is an ally. Now, that's the problem is not with DW because you are a television station. You can do anything. But have your governments taken a stand? My point is that why are we, as, remember as a prime minister, not as an ordinary citizen, when I spoke against Iraq war and against uh, Afghanistan invasion, I, I was a, a, a Pakistani citizen. When you become the prime minister, you then have to select that whatever I say, what consequences will my people face? And your priority must be the people of your country, um, which let, is let, the case with every country. Let, let me and pick up on that directly, when Mr. Hahn. Let, 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 let me pick up on that directly, Mr. Hahn, <clears throat> because um, in the immediate mm -hmm. aftermath of your term in office, uh, you were removed from office in April. Um, you, you have been uh, making accusations against the United States uh, very publicly. Uh, claiming a conspiracy, your word, uh, to remove you. The United States denies this. Um, this is an accusation you've been very public with. Do you stand by this claim that there was an American-led conspiracy to remove you from office? Well, Richard, let me at the outside explain that anyone would want to have great relationship with the U.S. It's a superpower. And Pakistan, particularly because we have large amount of exports which, which, were, which we sent to the U.S. And secondly, there's a, the most powerful Pakistani community is the Pakistani-American community. And I had perfectly good relationship with the Trump administration. Now, I'll just give you the facts. These facts uh, uh, were read out in our cabinet. They were uh, presented in front of a National Security Council, which then said that there was interference by the U.S., and they actually demarched the U.S. Uh, in Pakistan and in Washington. And the Supreme Court Chief Justice, the president of our country, has sent that cipher, uh, which, is, which was where I based my allegations on, has been sent to the Chief Justice to hold an inquiry. Now, I'll tell you what happened. 7th of March, a U.S. Uh, Under Secretary of State, Donald Liu, meets the Pakistani ambassador in Washington and and threatens him that unless Imran Khan was removed, I, the prime minister, was removed by a, a vote of no confidence, there will be consequences for Pakistan. On the next day, the no confidence is tabled. This threat was issued before the no confidence. So uh, we have this uh, cipher, official meeting between the ambassador and, the, and this uh, Under Secretary of State. This then, I, I saw that as well as it went to the president of the country. Now, after that, the moment he issued the threat, then came the no confidence motion, and then our people, my own party members and our allies started abandoning us. Now, so uh, we Mr. have so, evidence. So, Mr. Hanna, I would like to pick up the, the story at that point. So um, you have made these claims. The United States has denied that. Um, also, the, the military establishment in, in, uh, in Pakistan has not used the word conspiracy in what you described there. And I would put it to you that is not all of this talk of an American plot 
uh, really a way of obscuring a rather more simple truth that what happened uh, to you is that you lost support, you lost the confidence of Pakistan's military, that you had obviously some kind of falling out with General Bajwa, the head of the military, and this opened up the space for them to drop you and for you to be challenged. Well, Richard, let, let me just uh, give you a bit of a background. Uh, I was in power for almost four years. The first two years, our country went through a very difficult time. We inherited a bankrupt economy, one of the biggest current account deficits in our history. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that can be easily Googled. Next year came the, the COVID-19. So first two years, we really went through. The country went through a bad time, like, you know, in the second Everyone all over the world suffered during COVID-19. But in the third and fourth year, Pakistan's economic growth was the, was the best after 17 years. We grew at 5.6 and, uh, and 6 percent, respectively. So if our allies or our people had to leave us, I'm talking about, you know, in the no-confidence uh, vote, then they should have gone in the first two years when the country was going through tough times. When we were providing, we had the best employment uh, figures in the subcontinent at the time. Our economic growth was the best. Our exports were record. Our agriculture was booming. At that time, for them to uh, pull the plug, we know what happened. Because the American embassy was involved. It was meeting members, a dissidents of our, uh, uh, within Mr. our party. But Mr. Hunt, the American respect, embassy you, was you, meeting you, them. So we have, have evidence. You haven't answered my question, Mr. Han. Is it not the case that what was fatal for you was losing the confidence of the military? The military gave you their confidence in 2018. That helped you get into office. And now the military has dropped you. Uh, Richard, look. Uh, with, uh, by me making ac accusations right now, uh, you know, whatever I say, the other people will deny it. The best is the president of our country has sent that cipher, the record, re the record of the conversation between our ambassador and Donald Liu, he sent it to the Chief Justice of Pakistan to hold an open inquiry. So the best way, we'll find out what actually happened if this inquiry is held. So, you know, rather than uh, blaming but, other people, let the inquiry come out with the results. But, but you, I mean, you seem very hesitant to criticise the military, to criticise General Bajwa. I mean, would you, would you have concerns for your safety? Are you worried about criticising the military publicly? I'm not, I'm not worried about my safety. But I, the problem is that we live in a very rough neighbourhood. We need a strong army. Uh, just look around in the in the neighborhood we uh, we live. This what is going on in the world. I mean, uh, you know, Syria, Libya, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Yemen. So Pakistan needs a strong army, and so I would not want to do anything to undermine the strength of our army or to to blame our army. Uh, what if individuals are involved? Well, let the inquiry find out. This is the best way. The Chief Justice of Pakistan can hold an open inquiry. We'll find out who were the players involved in this conspiracy. But, but, but don't you we think feel Mr. it Hunt, was a conspiracy. It, 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 and let's see. It, but isn't, isn't this really the root of Pakistan's problems, is the, the military stranglehold uh, over real power? Um, and, and that this is what has been uh, such uh, holding the military back, I mean, Pakistan back. I mean, you say that Pakistan needs a strong military. But you don't need an all-encompassing, totally powerful military uh, that is able to pick up and drop uh, democratic leaders uh, as, as, as they say fit. Don't you see that is Pakistan's biggest core problem? Well, Richard, look, Pakistan was a security state. Why it became a security state? Because uh, the moment... Pakistan was uh, formed in 19... We, were, we got our independence in 1947. 48, there was a small war with India. And so the fear in Pakistan that a seven times bigger sized neighbor, and we started on, a, on the wrong foot with them, that's why we became dependent on our military. And so uh, the military obviously got prominence. Uh, so therefore, uh, when... Whenever the democratic uh, three times, uh, well, 
let me just say 62 years, past 62 years, uh, half the time we have been ruled by military and half the time we have been ruled by these two families, uh, the Bhuttos uh, and, the, and the Sharifs. So, unfortunately, when you, have, when you have military intervention and when the democratic government comes after that, it, it takes time to evolve the democratic culture. And so it also, that balance between the military and the democratic government, I think the country is moving towards a, a stage where we will find that balance between a security state and, uh, and a democratic state. And I feel we are moving in that direction. I feel if you have free and fair elections in Pakistan, you know, we will move into that direction where we'll have that balance. Um, Mr. Hunt, I would like to uh, close with the question about exactly that. You've made it clear you want to try to get back into power. Uh, you want to battle another election. Uh, will you commit here to accept the results, whichever way it goes? Uh, or are you concerned that it might be rigged against you? Look, as it stands today, Richard, I'm afraid uh, we have no conference in the Election Commission because it is totally biased. It is, you know, what, so far its record has been terrible. But for the future of Pakistan, the future of Pakistan lies in a truly democratic system. And de democracy means you have to have free, free and fair elections. If you do not have free and fair elections, when people don't accept the result after that, that's when the acrimony starts. So, you know, when in 2013, when the election results came, all the parties in the opposition, 22 opposition parties refused to accept the result. And we know the election was rigged. So there was this whole uh, movement to, uh, uh, you know, against this rigging. And we ended up in a judicial commission. Again, now this time, we are moving, I think we are moving towards elections. All we want is that there should be free and fair elections. And that is the beginning of a democratic process moving forward. Because we have now had almost 14 years of democracy, because we had eight years of General, uh, General Musharraf's dictatorship. Now there are 14 years of democracy, that, and we are moving forward. I feel that the country has moved forward. I think the days of martial law are over. And all we need, as I repeat, free and fair elections. Uh, just, we have time for one more very final question, Mr. Khan. Obviously, a major issue for you in uh, Pakistan's backyard is Afghanistan. Uh, we've seen what is happening with the Taliban there. Um, they're backtracking on commitments on human rights, on girls' education, and, uh, and many other issues. Humanitarian crisis really taking place there, security crisis too. Um, do you regret... Your, your sort of supportive position towards the, the Taliban, do you still believe that the world should recognize the Taliban? And if so, if you do believe that, why should the world recognize the Taliban, given what we're seeing, the reality there now? Well, firstly, Richard, um, the only people I support are the people of Afghanistan. And when, we want, when, we, when I spoke about that there's no military solution in Afghanistan, uh, it was knowing the history of Afghanistan that eventually, you know, like the Russians, uh, what, the Soviets, before that the British, uh, whenever outsiders have tried to impose a military solution, it hasn't worked in Afghanistan. They're very independ independent-minded people. Now, uh, immediately when you ever talk about, uh, you know, that there was no military solution, people like me were dubbed as being pro-Taliban. We are pro-Afghanistan. And at the moment, uh, people in Afghanistan have peace after 40 years. Now, in my opinion, you cannot impose human rights from outside, and especially to independent-minded people like Afghanistan. I feel that the people of Afghanistan, the government of Afghanistan must be engaged. And the more you mainstream the government, the more international community engages that, more chances of them sort of uh, finding this equilibrium, which from the conservatives and, and, uh, and, you know, talking about human rights. I feel that the more you engage them, the more uh, uh, Afghanistan, people of Afghanistan will assert their own rights. Because people of Afghanistan are strong, women are strong. Give them time, I think they will assert their rights. But I think by isolating Afghanistan, there's one danger which especially people of Pakistan are worried about, that if you isolate them and if the if there's chaos in Afghanistan, 
Um, there's a chance of terrorism, international terrorism, again, finding roots in Afghanistan. And Pakistan already suffers from uh, attacks from what is the TTP, uh, you know, the, the Pakistani Taliban who attack Pakistan from uh, Afghanistan soil. So therefore, in our interest, the more stable a government in Afghanistan, the less the chances of terrorism. But what do you say for, for, for Afghan women, many of whom have had to flee the country, fe fearing for their lives, for their rights? Um, it sounds like you're saying, well, just sort of accept it. 